Hello everyone, warm welcome from sunny Berlin, Germany. My name is Daniel Stecher. I'm the airline crewing Enigma facilitator and the expert guest speaker moderator. And it's a big pleasure having you with us today. And uh, we have our third guest speaker presentation of 2024. And today we have a guest from Colombia. It's Raquel McQueen from Avianca Airlines. And I'm very grateful that uh, she is very flexible because we had scheduled a talk from our Dutch colleague Victor, but he had a conflict. So both as part of a camaraderie of our community were able, able to swap their uh, presentations. And uh, so stage is yours, Raquel and uh, the audience, please. You can either type in your questions in the chat feature of Teams or you just raise your hand and I will help Raquel um, to call you in and then you can ask all your questions. Stage is yours, Raquel. Enjoy. Thank you. So hello to everyone. As uh, Daniel said, my name is Raquel McQueen. I currently work with Avianca Airlines, Avianca Group. Uh, I'm Panamanian anyhow, uh, but happen to live and, and share the Colombian culture. And today the idea is to take you through the Colombia crew management secrets and hints as Daniel very, the, um, he called it very, let's call it, uh, he was very, um, I can't find the word in English, but very clever with, this, with, with his words. But please feel free to interrupt me as I go through. And today, the idea is to learn a little bit about Evianca Group. Then I'll take you through the unique characteristics of uh, the aviation in Colombia. And then uh, maybe go through the strategies um, that we use to address the challenges here in Colombia. So to learn a bit, a, a bit about Evianca Group, I'm going to start with uh, some historic events. Avianca is a 104 year old um, airline, so that means that's a lot of history. So today I'm only going to highlight three of them. The first is the foundation. So Avianca was founded on December the 5th, 1919 in Barranquilla, Colombia. And after that, in 2010, we had the fusion with DACA Group, which led us to what we know today as Avianca Group. And in 2020, I think this is maybe the most important event. You know, we all know what happened during 2020 and during the pandemic, Avianca went through chapter 11. And he, during the pandemic, uh, we started a transformation uh, to emerge with a business a lot more efficient and providing on-time service at the same time. Actually, last year we won the, the global, we were the, the global winner for on-time performance by Serum. And uh, the idea is to tell you about how we work in Avianca. This is a little bit about the network. We have more than 17 70, sorry, destinations in America north central and south america also in the caribbean and three destinations in europe so talking about the composition avianca group has six aocs for the passengers um, business and a cargo airline so we have avianca ecuador salvador costa rica avianca guatemala avianca colombia Avianca Express, which is the regional operator here in Colombia, and Avianca Cargo. The fleet consists in 129 Airbus 320, uh, 16 Boeing 787, and we have six Airbus 330 for the cargo operation. So before talking about the Colombian peculiarity, we need to go through uh, Avianca's uniqueness. So these are the six uh, subsidiaries for uh, passengers. The biggest being uh, Avianca Colombia. We have over 1,300 uh, pilots, uh, over 21,000 cabin crews, 
we have seven crew bases only in Colombia. And part of the uniqueness is that in Colombia, we have three unions for flight deck and two unions for cabin crew. So for Salvador, we have 223 pilots, 372 cabin crew, three crew bases for pilots, only one for cabin crew. In Ecuador, we have 113 pilots and 194 cabin crew and two crew bases. Costa Rica has very similar uh, um, values, only one crew base. And for Avianca Express, the regional, we have 37 pilots and 60 cabin, cabin crew, one crew base here in Bogota. And Guatemala is our smallest subsidiary with one crew base, 20 pilots and 25 cabin crew. At this moment, we are in training, so that's why we have a couple more pilots there training this um, a kind of new uh, crew base. So we have two planning teams. We have a planning team here in Colombia and the other one in Salvador. Uh, in total, 16 people uh, forming those groups and they manage all of the five different regulations. Uh, that we have in each AOC. Uh, part of how we work through all of these AOCs that are in different countries is using uh, the tools of the wet lease and the fleet interchange, uh, moving aircraft and also routes from one to other whenever we have uh, to find productivity in the different uh, AOCs. So let's go through the secrets as uh, Daniel uh, called. And these are the uniqueness of Colombian regulation. And I'm going to mention only some today, but the first one is days off. So Colombian regulation states that the days off cannot be single. So they all need to be paired at least by two. And the monthly entitlement cannot be reduced in the day to day. So that means that we can have different combinations. It can be, so for example, pilots have nine total days off in a month. So they can have five and four or three, 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 two, four, three, but never single days off. So this leads into some improductiveness because we uh, at some point the combinations will lead to have more than five consecutive working days which is the maximum and that's where the blank days enter because then the Colombian law has this blank days as additional days off but to cut the sequence of the consecutive working days so in general Besides from having the minimum days off per crew, we additional count a, a um, an average of blank days because we will need them to uh, add or to at least be legal in the con in the sequence of uh, consecutive working days. So in the training side, we also have an interesting, and maybe you have heard about the N for transitions. So here. In Colombia, for example, we have the 320 fleet and we have the 787 fleet. So the way it works is that if you first enter as a pilot in the company, you start as a first officer in the 320. And then when you have a transition, you continue to be a first officer in the biggest fleet in the 787. And then you get an upgrade, but in the, in the 320 and so forth. So this makes it a bit more complex to whenever you want to grow. For example, in the biggest fleet, you need to make sure that you have people to fill that pipeline and to be taken uh, from each of the positions for whatever position you need. Also, in the union matters, as I mentioned before, eh, only in Colombia, fortunately, uh, we have uh, unions, but we have enough for all of the AOCs. We have three unions for, for pilots and two unions for cabin crew. So this makes the management a bit more interested. Um, and besides from that, uh, the crew can be multi-affiliated. So 
That means that I can be part of more than one union at the time. I only have to select what's my main union. And for all of the main topics that we need to address with the unions, it's always, at least for pilots that we're in a lot of um, uh, projects at the time, we need to do all the conversations by tree and try to make all of them get into kind of the same idea to get an agreement without having them sitting in the same table. So yeah, it makes it a bit more uh, interesting, I want to say, um, because of all the negotiations that you need to go through with the different unions. Also in, in cabin crew, so in addition to the positions that we know as the purser or the flight attendants, we have additional categories. So uh, we have the purser that can only fly international flights and the person that only fly uh, the national flights. So whenever we're doing the rosters in Colombia, um, sometimes it's, it, I mean, it adds some more uh, challenges in the process in order to keep all of the categories productive and also to maintain a difference in per diems and so forth by groups. Um, Raquel, are you are you going to to talk later also about what happened five years ago? I was just posting a blog post I was writing five years ago where there was a strike at Avianca and <laughs> Boeing was providing some pilots which were employed by a contractor and of course that was a big topic and so on so i i would call this is a somehow a secret because how to how to somehow cope a strike with some rental pilots is a, is a, good, <laughs> is a good hint i would say it was a very interesting i was not in avianca at the time but i definitely heard all the story about it uh it was very difficult times um that was uh, the strike was caused by uh, or called by the biggest um, union and it's a very strong union here um, and at the end we had no pilots flying the, the flights uh, so yeah the strategy of having uh, rented pilots to take the operation um, forward uh, was maybe the only option at that time and um, but I can say that at this moment uh, relationship with the unions are a lot more better uh, and we have I think that we have uh, learned the lesson from from that time of keeping the unions involved and having constant communication so it it, ha it has helped and we are in a better position now and working together with all three of them for pilots but yeah uh, five years ago was Historic for Avianca also, you're right. And then continuing in terms of geography, eh, Colombia has a very unique geography because of all uh, the different um, elevations that it has. And this cause that we have multiple air domestic airports with short and narrow runways. And um, it requires pilot expertise. And part of what we do here is that we restrict the first officers to land in this specific airports. Uh, so, um, for example, here in Colombia, it's super usual that we have, a, I want to say, bad weather, low visibility in the mornings. And like whenever we have uh, something happening in the aircraft with the captain in any of these airports, they need to divert to a different airport. So yeah, only the operation inside of Colombia is uh, very unique and very challenging um, because of the weather and because of the conditions of the runways in several of the domestic airports. So now I'm gonna tell you a little bit of how we cope or how we we manage all those challenges here in Colombia. So in terms of the regulation, uh, part of what we do is uh, we have had to be creative to, to seek of, uh, for productivity 
because the same regulation uh, doesn't go in that sense. Um, and we have understand, understood that uh, the network plays a, a really a great place or important place in terms of productivity of the crews. And we have developed a very um, close relationship with network planning. Um, and we have set agreements between the areas. So for example, uh, for us, is uh, one of the, the KPIs that we use a lot is the block time per day. And today that's a conversation that we can have with someone from the network planning. I, I can tell them like, yeah, the, the block time per day is too low. I need to at least two, two more minutes. And that's something that they can understand today. And yeah, so we we get to uh, to be part of those consi important considerations in terms of what we're going to operate and where we're going to operate. And also, um, I think that this is something not only happening in Avianca, but after the pandemic, the network is not as uh, stable as before. We have a lot of more changes and and that's also happening here so what we try to do is to agree on dates on whatever we have in certain dates that's the information that we're going to use to continue the process and all the validations before adding or um canceling operation so i think that's a process that has um improved a lot uh, after the pandemic and yeah, and, and it's it's a bit hard uh, to cope between uh, balancing well-being for the crews and productivities. Uh, so we are still working a lot in that part. Uh, we are currently implementing some uh, tools in order to help us here. But yeah, whenever you seek for productivity, then you have pilots saying like, hey, uh, that's a lot of flying. Uh, so yeah, the the, the balance is, is a bit tricky, but yeah, we are in in that path. Talking about the training, and this is a, this is a tricky one because uh, when you talk about productivity, you want to operate hours with the less amount of crew possible, and having this condition of the end in training uh, goes a bit in the other way. Uh, because you need to have some kind of buffer, uh, at least in the first group of the first officer for 320, in order to be able to react to whatever happens during the year. If we want to operate more hours, uh, you know that contracting and training a pilot takes, takes a long time. So yeah, you always need to have some kind of buffer so that you can react um, to whatever conditions we have during the year. So uh, besides from that, we also have managed to have some flexibility in when, uh, if we need to add more transitions, if we need to delay transitions, uh, just to try to not have much of a buffer in that sense. And also, I think that's something that has helped a lot is to have an attrition forecast uh, that is more, is not only the historic, I think that before uh, what we used to do is like, oh, how many attrition we had last year? Okay, so let's guess that this is what's happening month by month. But for example, uh, I remember that last year something that happened is uh, that the U.S. opened this new visa where you can you know apply and work there and there's a lot of pilots interested in that so that's something that we took into consideration that didn't happen before but that you need to uh, add more variables into that attrition uh, in order to be able to operate uh, when you cannot react that fast due to the training conditions Regarding the union, as I was mentioning before, uh, we we have learned and, and practiced the constant communication with unions. So for example, 
at this moment. We are working in, in several projects and we try to uh, we try to to uh, communicate and let them know where we are at, what we know at the moment, when are we going to discuss. So maybe giving them more information, getting them involved, have a better that relationship, and also make them part of uh, the different projects. Um, and we have had to develop strategies. Uh, to be more effective with various unions. As I mentioned, it's not easy to have a discussion of, let's discuss the parameters for PBS, but union number one. Now let's discuss with union number two and get to an agreement without having them in the same table. Uh, so yeah, we have, a, we have that challenge and well, it makes it more interesting if I may say. And in terms of geography, we really don't have a lot there to to do, um, but the part of uh, what we have in the training program is that we go out and progressively these airports in the training so that pilots can uh, get familiar with them and then um, they can fly there and and like make that pool of pilots that can actually land in those airports uh, like a bigger pool there. Okay, um, Avianca is a group operations and seeing exactly these four items, regulation, but also flexibility, unions and geographies. Um, I know from a European group operations that they had full flexibility in the case of a disruption. They were able to assign a crew member from AOCA on an aircraft from AOCC with pilots from, AO, from AOC uh, D, for example. You have a similar a possibility to swap resources in the case of a sickness wave in one of the AOCs, or you have AOGs uh, from uh, the other AOC that you can share resources and help each other, or is the union or the regulation not uh, allowing this? Uh, first, the, un the regulation, and, and also there is a union matter there. So by regulation, we do not have a lot of flexibility. What we can do, and, and as I mentioned before, uh, we, do, we can actually share routes. So in the day-to-day, -day, if we have the necessity, we can change the operator in those that we have the permission, but we're not able to, to mix like a cockpit from one AOC and cabin crew from the other. So it needs to be the complete crew, uh, but that's the, the amount of flexibility that we have. Uh, we can surely uh, share some routes or even aircrafts, but not mix the crew at the moment. Is it because the union doesn't want this or is it because it's the aeronautical uh, space limitation or regulations which are not allowing this? Yeah, the different regulation doesn't allow that allow it at the moment, and uh, yeah, it will be difficult a difficult topic also with, with the unions. Uh, so yeah, for now it's it's just a matter of of um, trading or swapping uh, or moving routes from one to the other to take the operation uh, forward. But yeah, that's that's it in that side. We we do not have more flexibility there. And so we have some other strategies also um, that we have put in place in order to cope with all of this. And, and in the last years, uh, we also ended right after the pandemic, uh, we went through a system of homologation. So um, this was from the AOC systems, we have two AOCs, one in Salvador and one in, in Colombia. So Colombia's AOC um, controls all the Colombian operation plus Ecuador. And then in Salvador, we have the control for um, Salvador, Costa Rica and Guatemala operation. Um, so at this point, we share the same systems uh, alongside for dispatch. Uh, for tracking, uh, for the flight management. So that makes it easier for disruptions. Um, and it also makes the processes more simple. Um, 
And we also made the same for the systems. So uh, at the beginning, after the fusion with, with Tacket Group, uh, we didn't have the same systems, but since that point to now, uh, we have managed, uh, we, we finished a couple months ago, uh, and we have managed to be in the same system for the crew management. So for training and for the optimizations, for the crew tracking, all the reporting. So we are able to pull information from uh, the different AOCs from the, the same systems. And this actually helps us. We have had times where I can have people from uh, the planning team in Salvador helping out and the planning team in Colombia because we had uh, people that left the team. Uh, so it makes it a lot more easier to cope with all this. Um, challenges and also um, automate process. I think this is a task that um, never ends. <laughs> you always find an opportunity to to make it better, to make it easier. So uh, this is something in where, where we are uh, still working on uh, and we are in the path of implement, implementing solutions for um, the trip trading and um, for PBS and also the processes uh, within the planning team uh, in order to, to be more effective uh, with all the, the different uh, rule sets and the different regulations that we have. And part of the, the, the way that we kind of measure how we're doing we have some KPIs. Well, the first one is uh, pretty like uh, known for everyone and it's gross productivity. But we have created some um, BI um, charts and we have one called the roster completion and the other one is the roster satisfaction. So in roster completion, we have we measure like the how we are is the comparison, sorry, between what we publish and what the, the, the crew finally operates. And we compare days off, we compare vacation days, and we compare training. So um, it just has to be a training day, it doesn't have to be the same um, classes, but the idea is to understand how much does that roster di disrupts after the, during the operation, so we also have like the uh, acid completion. So this is a measurement flight by flight, day by day from what uh, in a specific crew was um, uh, published versus what he ended uh, um, operating. Um, this is the most acid one. Uh, that number still uh, is not maybe in the sweet spot, uh, but then we have roster satisfaction. And in this one, um, this one is composed by uh, the comparison also between the published and the um, and and the day-to-day -day operation of uh, the initial hour of operation, the final hour of operation. Uh, we also have the count of legs, so if I had four legs published and then I end up doing six. Um, also we have in this um, in this KPI, so as the hours, the aircraft changes. I think this is something, at least here in Colombia, that's something that crews, um, they don't like to make a lot of uh, aircraft changes. Um, and we have the complexity here in the airport that you have the domestic um, area and then you have the international flight that tend to walk a lot. So uh, we have an agreement that from the planning, we only publish with one aircraft change as a maximum. Uh, if they have more, it's because the operation generate those additional aircraft changes. Um, so yeah, basically this is the way that we measure the, the crew planning, uh, the, the crew planning part at this moment. And well, uh, 
Avianca plays a very important uh, role here connecting really remote areas in Colombia. There are places where if you go by car, it's more than 14, 20 hours, and you can do it by plane in 30 minutes. Um, so yeah, it plays a really important role uh, in connecting regions and the economic development also of moving uh, goods and food in, in all these regions here in Colombia while addressing all the challenges uh, and opportunities in navigating in this uh, in the regulation that that we have to work with. Um, so yeah, that's basically uh, what I brought today to tell to talk to you about the hints and the secrets of the Colombian aviation. Thank you very much. I think very uh, insightful. Um, I would I would also like to know your assessment about the future because I know you are attending conferences, industry conferences, you are going to vendor conferences. So what's your outlook? You are now five years with Avianca. Um, how, how you see the progress and how do you see yourself in five or ten years from now? Will you use the same processes? Um, will you have more hints for us? Will you have the flexibility <laughs> amongst the group because unions and regulations are helping that? Or would you tell us exactly the same in five years time because nothing goes quick in our industry except the aircraft? <laughs> yeah, so that's a difficult question. So at the moment, uh, we are implementing, as I mentioned, PPS and trip trading. So we do have a manual PPS and a manual trip trading process. Um, so that will help us gain some productivity um, in the planning and in the day to day. Um, so I will think that five day, five years from now, um, that will be our new reality. We will be thinking about what's the other options in PBS that we can add. And what else can we trade through trip trading? Because today it will only be flights and days off, or maybe I want to trade training. Uh, so yeah, uh, I think that five years from now, the idea is to be more efficient and to be able to have all the processes that today we do in a manual way or with, with a lot of manual intervention uh, in a more automated way. Um, and, 10 years from now, I, I can't tell. Aviation changes a lot. Uh, but from what we have seen in the different uh, uh, conferences, uh, I do think that we can seek for a more seamless uh, system. Uh, yeah, to have to be more uh, simple in our different systems. We do manage do they a lot of um, interfaces between different systems and that's a uh, high maintenance uh, uh, configuration. Uh, so maybe that's what I see 10 years from now to have our seamless integrations to be more simple in order to make the work better for, for, for the team. We have a question from Steve. Steve, uh, do you want to ask your questions verbally? which you have put in the chat notes? Sure, can do, yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, great presentation. Thank you very much for that, Phil. Um, one of the things I was interested in is how accurate uh, you found your attrition forecasting to be. I know you talked about using historical data as well as uh, some of the social knowns. Um, how, how accurate have you found that since uh, COVID? So since COVID, we, we have been better now. I think that the maybe second year after COVID, we, it, the attrition was simply a lot more than what we could uh, ever foresee. Uh, but no, I think that we are more uh, conservative and adding these other variables in the consideration has helped us to be uh, more accurate. So we are in the third month of 2024 
And three years ago, it was a disaster, the amount of attrition that we had. And, and without having that, that amount considered. And this year we are very aligned to what has happened. So I want to think that being more conservative and also uh, adding the other variables have helped a lot uh, to try to be in line to what's actually happening. Great, thank you. Talking about uh, the pandemic, uh, while talking with uh, several airlines in the world uh, in 2020, they were all speaking about shortening the typical roster period from monthly to rather two weekly or even only uh, weekly. Um, and some of them have kept going this um, planning horizon in order to be more flexible because the unions were agreeing on it. Um, what was the situation in, in Avianca at Colombia? And have you kept some of the items you have agreed with the unions because it was a win-win for both sides, uh, flexibility, lifestyle, but also maybe in the interest of, of the company? Yeah, so I think that it's, it's not a secret that uh, everyone is looking for pilots. Uh, so um, the company at the moment is actually... In the same way that we're seeking for productivity, we're also seeking for well-being and, you know, pilot's comfort. So um, in that sense, in the like seeking for quality of life for the crew, I do not see that the unions will agree in having less visibility in their schedules, reducing the amount to, to buy weekly or, or weekly. Um, this is something that we do have uh, like included in the agreements. So that will be a, an extended negotiation if we wanted to go there. I don't see it uh, in the future, in the near future for, for Avianca, uh, reducing that visibility. Shane, you have a nice question. Maybe you want to ask it directly. Sure, appreciate the uh, the insight, Raquel. It's, it's nice to hear um, some of the insights on uh, from your department and ultimately the um, um, the operation down in Colombia. What do you see is is the biggest challenge and or threat for for the crew resources? Uh, you've talked a little bit about technology. You've talked a little bit about uh, you know pilot recruiting and and pilot attrition. But in your mind, what do you see is the biggest challenge that you're going to be faced with over the next couple of years? I think that um, like in the system wise, I will say to be able to make more scenarios in a shorter time, maybe to use some AI and understand how we have paired trips, use that information to help us take more better decisions in the future uh, to make the decisions about, I don't know, the crew bases, we have very small bases here in, in Colombia, for example. Uh, so I will say that in that sense, maybe getting some help from AI in order to be better at taking decisions in the crew planning department. And the challenge is to be able to, I mean, the company is always is now having a lot more changes in the network planning and this response mostly to be more efficient and to not operate something that doesn't make sense or to operate something that makes sense now and it didn't before. Uh, so being able to uh, attend those different uh, necessities from the network planning in a shorter time, uh, I think that will be the challenge because I, I don't see that the, uh, the market is going to slow down. It's either going faster in changes. Uh, so be able to keep up to date with that. I think that will be the biggest challenge. Claire, you raised your hand. Yes, um, first, thank you for such a great presentation. It's interesting that, you know, in just talking with other carriers, I think everyone is facing different flavors of the same problems, you know, volatil volatility in the network plan and you know, volatility in crew behavior, such as attrition. 
Um, so it's, I don't know if it's comforting or not to know we're all <laughs> facing many of the same problems. Um, and I know Shane, you presented on that um, back in January as well. One question I have, I, I really like the concept of um, looking at roster completion and seeing kind of what types of things are breaking when they get into the operation. Um, what type of capabilities do you have beyond just going in and, and looking at specific pairings? What what type of capabilities do you have to trend sort of the root cause of why um, things are, are not completing as planned? Um, or is that something that you're still working on? Yeah, so at the moment, we're capable of um, looking at, in a graphical way, uh, how it goes, it, 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 it corrupts in the operation. And we have now at least three years of historic events. So we try to be better each time. And we have applied some strategies in the SOC uh, in order to, for example, we have someone that we call the, the future planning in the SOC. So he's looking three days and forward. And whenever someone has a, a sick call or something, this person is trying to put the person, the, the crew back to their original um, roster. Uh, so we have um, put in place strategies from this measurements. We are at the moment working at something that we think that will help to understand. And so whenever we're doing the planning, um, we have only logic aircraft lines. And only up to nine days before the operation day, then we have the actual tail assigned to that flight. Uh, so what we're adding is like the different windows to understand in time when we have the biggest um, um, damage in the rosters. So we're having, for example, that we can read in nine days, then that we can read a day before the operation and have a final uh, reading in the same day, like the, whatever ends up happening. And I think that that will give us more information in when are things happening um, actually. It, just because uh, we have, like, in the planning, everything looks good. We have only one aircraft change, and, you know, people have their days off and whatever they requested. And, yeah, to know if it's maybe the tail assignment, maybe whatever the logic aircraft is are, are not to logic at the end. Uh, or definitely the operation just has a lot of um, different complexities as weather and so forth, and that's where we're losing it. Thank you. I, I have another question from, again, pandemic and post-pandemic. So during the pandemic, physical distance was a must and people stayed home, worked remotely. Um, of course, airlines had not so much capacity up in the air, but at least they kept the operations. If they could fly cargo, everything was fine. Is it still possible that you hire people even from now remote locations outside Bogota? Um, if they work for Avianca Colombia and you make use of also getting talent from other cities in Colombia or everybody was now required to get back into the office? So um, like in the administrative um, part, even before the pandemic, we already had a, a, um, a mix um, system. So we had before the pandemic three days in the office and two at home. Uh, so no, we're almost the same. Some have two days and three at home. So for us, it wasn't that new. Um, yeah, and, and I think that uh, at least from uh, the crew planning area, um, I have not seen like a degradation in the productivity of the team, maybe the other way around. So I think it's something that uh, we shall try to to keep because I, I have seen this year a lot of companies like trying to get back to the office fully. Uh, but yeah, at least in, in, in our side, it hasn't been that way. And would you go even uh, further and would hire Shane from Canada? He can stay in Calgary, but work for Avianca. Is this something which is feasible or is there somehow 
uh, another regulation that you have to be at least in Colombia in order to work for Avianca Airlines? So that's a company um, regulation, let's say. And the company wants us to be at least some days per week at the office. So oh. yeah, Shane can be in Canada, but maybe he, ne- he needs to travel in <laughs> the, the weekend and, and come a couple of days and then go back. And a lot of people here in Colombia, like during the pandemic, you know, that people went to more in the countryside and, and here in Colombia, a lot of people live in different states and they do that. They, they just um, fly back and forth in order to, to comply. <laughs> Shay, you raised your hand and then you dropped it again. Yeah, I was going to just a follow up question just around how um, how Avianca measures roster completion. And maybe this will be a follow up question. I'd love to dig into that a bit more. We're on a journey right now of building out more um, in-depth reporting. And that was one that really piqued my interest because it's a, it, it's a we've recently gone through a, a broader study around how we can drive more um, schedule stability for uh, in our operation as a whole. And one of the key findings from that was, I think we didn't fully understand how much change was occurring from original roster creation to, mm-hmm. to the day of operation um, and, and the multiple changes, both that we were making as a company we had visibility in what the crew members were doing. We offer a lot of flexibility here at WestJet for our crew members and trip trades and partial trip trades and goes through a, a bit of a you know a slice and dice and, and the pairings can be chopped up in a number of different ways, but also layering on what we were doing as an operation and how much that was being um, uh, modified. So I'd love to kind of maybe afterwards talk a little bit more with you around how you're measuring that specifically, what the specific key PI, is it a percentage, is it a, a numerical value and then and then how you investigate that oh great and, and you just mentioned something that i it's something that we have uh, that's the next plan after we we finish like the, the the time windows measurement and it's being able to extract or uh, recognize the trade trading from this uh, measurements because today all the changes count so yeah, we need to put aside the trip trading to understand what's caused by the pilot and what's because of the operation. And and yeah, basically we have maybe a, <laughs> um, so IT has a fully copy of the database from our main system. Uh, so we have all the movement there. And what we do is so we have a four measurements there we have the asset completion vacation days off and training and yeah and and if you if if you want we can further have a talk of how we measure each of them Uh, but yeah maybe the asset completion which measures the flights is the hardest one Uh, because if you want to comply with flight one two three and day one and then apply four five six for each pilot uh, it's complex in the operation, but yeah. I'll reach out uh, afterwards and set something up. Yeah, I'd love to sure. talk more about that. Is there another question from the audience? So then, Raquel, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Um, I think uh, now we know a lot of the secrets and hints from Colombia. Um, and um, I also can recommend everybody to fly to Colombia and spend your vacation. There's a fantastic country. I was there several times and I always loved it. Um, the good news is we have next month our um, talk from Victor from Transavia. And uh, we have plenty of new members in our community. So we have meanwhile more than 700 community members. And for all of you who were just joining, you have the possibility to just recap all the presentations we had in the past. And we had plenty of experts sharing their best practice and their secrets and hints from um, their uh, local airline. And um, so make use of it. And of course, it's also helping you to connect with your industry fellows 
And we can also look ahead. In May, we all come together in Italy, in Modena, uh, for the upcoming Agiforce crew uh, conference. And um, we will have also an um, expert panel on the 23rd of May. So if you are interested, because you're also attending the event in Italy, please get back to me because I'm going to moderate again this expert panel. And uh, we have already Aditi who confirmed again her appearance on this panel. And it would be very uh, grateful to have more experts from the industry coming uh, to Italy and have you on stage. Yeah, and thank you for everybody joining us today. Um, next month, uh, we come together again. And if we are not seeing each other, please stay healthy and safe. And if you have a colleague who is smart, upbeat, positive and enthusiastic, kindly do the needful and invite him or her to our Enigma community. And thank you again, Raquel and all the attendees who have uh, actively contributed to a very fruitful session. Appreciate very much. Stay healthy and safe. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Raquel. Bye.